Hello guys, good morning. Are you all fresh? Huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, very good, very good. Okay, so we have been seeing uh, chemical bonding, right? So we finished ionic bonds and we ventured into covalent bonds. That's what we did. And then uh, the, we saw, uh, with the help of a graph, we saw how a covalent bond is getting formed when they're isolated and say when they're coming closer, the attractive forces dominate. And at a point of time, there is going to be a minima, minimum value in the graph. And there I see a chemical bond is getting formed, a covalent bond is getting formed where the force of attraction is equal to the force of repulsion. And then if I'm going to bring them any more closer, I see that uh, the force of repulsion increases and then stability decreases. So that minimum point is where I have maximum stability because I have minimum energy. And that's where I say the covalent bond is getting formed. Okay, so we understood that. And then we entered, and then we entered to see uh, what is Lewis theory, right? So Lewis theory, I said to you, it is going to just based on octet or duplet rules, right? And then we went on to see uh, certain uh, Lewis dot structures, right? How to draw the covalent bonds, how many bonds, all that. And then lastly, we saw for H2SO4, right? And then, okay, before that, I told you uh, every every element, like every compound need not have eight electrons in its valence shell. I can have more than eight electrons also. I can have less than eight electrons also, right? The example I gave you for less than eight electrons was BF3, right? And uh, more than eight electrons, I gave you an example for H2SO4, right? So all these cases, you will have either less than eight electrons or more than eight electrons. And I told you octet or duplet is not the only criteria for stability, right? This is where we stopped, right? Okay, so we'll venture more and more into covalent bonds, right? And we'll see what are the other, other things which are there, right? Okay. Ah. So that's about Lewis theory, guys. Right? That's about uh, Lewis theory, okay? Uh, so we'll actually, actually what I can do is, uh, there is one more theory called as next theory, which we're going to see is valence bond theory, right? So I'll be, there is a lot of correlation, there's a lot of connection between uh, Lewis theory and the theory which I'm going to see now. Okay, uh, fine. So we'll see this valence bond theory. Sir, for Lewis theory, you will use no notes, sir. For Lewis theory. Lewis theory? You will use no, no notes, sir. Notes? Yes, sir, for Lewis theory, sir. Ah, nothing. You just wanted the definition of Lewis Lewis theory. Sir. Ah, nothing. Can Lewis theory or to tell that the valence electrons, the uh, the valence electrons in the atom, right, will make sure the covalent bond is getting formed in order to get their octet or duplet satisfied. That's it. Lewis theory just says that. You can. I'll if I'll give you a proper definition. Take it down first, and then we'll go for VB. The atoms involving in a covalent bond, I am telling for Lewis theory. Right? Okay. The atoms involving in a covalent bond, <clears throat> the atoms involving in a covalent bond will share their electrons, will share their electrons in valence shells will share their electrons in their valence shells in their valence shells in order in order to get their octet or duplet in order to get their octet or duplet satisfied. In order to get their octet or duplet satisfied. Simple definition. It's, pure, it's purely based on octet or duplet. Right? Okay, fine. Now we'll move on to this theory, balance bond theory. So first I'll give you the definition. Take down the definition. on the definition so balance bond theory says a covalent bond is formed a covalent bond is formed 
when a covalent bond is formed when the unpaired electrons when the unpaired electrons in the valence shells when the unpaired electrons in the valence shell of the atoms gets paired gets paired by overlapping of by overlapping of atomic orbitals by overlapping of atomic orbitals okay i repeat the statement it says that a covalent bond is formed when the unpaired electrons in the valence shell of the atoms gets paired by overlapping of their atomic orbitals very very simple okay fine now how do we go about it we'll see right now let me take an example and then so that you'll be able to understand better right fine so from the uh, statement you can see that there are going to be some unpaired electrons single electrons in that particular shell in that particular orbital right so they will have one uh, say unpaired electron in one of the atoms another unpaired electron in one of the atom so they will come together to make these two electrons getting paired right and they say that these two electrons are going to get paired by means of overlapping of orbitals right by, by means of overlapping of orbitals what do you mean by overlapping of orbitals nothing like two orbitals s orbital and p orbital coming together right to form a covalent bond or say p orbital and another p orbital coming together to form a covalent bond so all these things are possible or even d orbitals can come into the picture okay first we we'll speak first we we'll see about this uh, one example we'll take so we'll be able to understand okay the best example i can take is h2 right so if i take h2 molecule the simplest of them all right so i know each hydrogen atom is having 1s1 and 1s1 right so you see that in each of these 1s orbitals i have single electrons coming into the picture okay so now what is going to happen is so i have an s orbital which is having one electron i have another s orbital which is having another electron so you know that s orbitals are spherical in shape right so i have two s orbitals having one one electron unpaired electron see it is not paired if i put one more electron here it is getting paired right but each of these two orbitals are having unpaired electrons valence shells right now what they tell now they will come together right they will come together to form a covalent bond so they will come together in the sense they will going to overlap like this these two will overlap like this and in the overlapping space i have two electrons you can see that right in the overlapping space these two electrons will come together get paired and a covalent bond is getting formed between the two hydrogen atoms okay so what do you what do you see here each of these s orbit in each of these hydrogen atoms had one one electron in their one s orbitals right so i represented it right now this representation representation talks about the shapes of the orbitals along with the number of electrons okay now what the what the theory is what the statement said the orbitals is having single electrons that is unpaired electron will come together to form a covalent bond so this is what is my overlapping overlapping of orbitals right so these orbitals will come together to overlap and then as, as a, the electrons are shared and obviously the bond is formed understood right what in what 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 this valence bond theory says okay so we'll speak more about this overlapping right because uh, there can be two types of overlapping right? i would say uh, okay then we'll go into it or i'll give you one more example okay hope you hope you have taken this down guys did you take this down yes yeah. sir okay right say so now i'll take the example of o2 so for example okay so i'll take the example of o2 now each oxygen atom is having 
can i say 2p4 and 2p4 i'm talking about the valence shell configuration obviously before the electrons are there 1s2 2s2 2p4 1s2 2s2 2p4 okay so in 2p4 you know how to fill the electrons I have to follow hans rule of maximum multiplicity so 1 2 3 4 done same way for this 1 2 3 4 done <clears throat> Okay, so the first thing I have to look at is which orbitals are having unpaired electrons, right? So if you look at the first p orbital here, this p orbital is having paired electrons. So that cannot involve in bonding. That cannot involve in bonding. But look at the other two p orbitals. They are having single single electrons. This is also having single single electrons. Okay, so now there are going to be two p orbitals. There are going to be two p orbitals having single electrons each right say if the first say i'll call it as px py and pz say this is also px py and pz hope you all the names which are which you are familiar with okay so now py and py comes together right now py and py comes together now how can i represent the overlap so if i say py this is p orbital this is p orbital say this is py and py okay so each is each of them are having one one electron each you can see that one electron and one electron okay now they are going to come together to get overlapped and when the overlap happens the electrons will be shared and one bond will be formed okay so now how can i show the overlap i don't have space okay no problem i will i think you'll not be able to see if i write it here I'll just rub this off, rub this O2 alone apart. Right? I'm talking about O2. So I will be able to show the overlap like this. Say something like this. Okay, can you see the overlap happening here? Right? And in the I have a very small space, but in this space I'm going to have two electrons. Are you able to understand when the overlapping of P or beta all happens? I can have electrons getting shared and then the first covalent bond is formed right now please remember oxygen is going to form two bonds a double bond is getting formed it's, it's easily understood from this also there are two orbitals having unpaired electron so if two of i mean this orbital and that orbital comes together one covalent bond and this orbital and this orbital comes together another covalent bond okay <clears throat> fine but the orbit okay this is the first overlap py py overlapped and i got one bond okay now what if the other orbital also comes into the picture the other orbital also comes into the picture now that is going to be little complicated right that is going to be little complicated okay first first what you have to understand is what is the internuclear axis right you have to understand this term what is the internuclear axis what do you mean by internuclear axis i'll tell you that right so for guys guys if it's not finished yet i'm rubbing, rubbing this part because there is going to be one more bond getting formed i will explain how that bond is getting formed first bond is over okay so i will take this off hope you have taken this down <clears throat> okay now look at this I am telling <clears throat> this orbital, like basically the, the two oxygen atoms are going to come together, right? The two P orbitals are coming together like this. They are undergoing head-on collision, isn't it? They are undergoing head-on collision so that the orbitals are overlapped and then the electrons are shared and first bond is getting formed. Over, right? So this is basically my y-axis. That's what I understand. They can come head-on collision like this, right? And obviously, that's what I said. This is what is called as my internuclear axis. So, what do you mean by internuclear axis is that in which axis, right? In which axis the nucleus are approaching, right? So, it can be x axis, it can be y axis, or it can be z axis. It is up to you to choose. It is up to you to choose, right? But you have to decide one first. Either of that, right? All any either of the three, you have to decide which one can be either of them, or any of them can be the internuclear axis, right? Now, once you have decided that, now look at this. I had uh, first or I mean oxygen, second oxygen. So this is my Py. This is another Py. 
right? This is PY. This is my internuclear axis. So both of them got overlapped and I got the first sigma bond. Okay. Now, what was the next one which was remaining? Right? There was one more orbital which was having one single electron and that was PZ. Correct. Now think and tell me, can I have this kind of overlap for PY also? That means can I have an head-on overlap for P, P sorry, not PY, PZ also? Think and tell me. Are you understand? Are you able to understand my question? Could you repeat, sir? Ah, so what I'm telling is, so if I take PY as the internuclear axis, that is the axis in which the oxygen atoms are approaching together. Okay. So if at all they are approaching together in Y axis, obviously my you know how the shape of P orbitals will look. If I say PY, so if this is the Y axis, PY will be like this. Yes, Correct. Sir. So PY is coming like this. Another PY is coming like this. So they will overlap. Head on, head on overlap. Right. So what I am asking now is there is one more orbital which is having unpaired electron. That is PZ. Right. Can PZ also come like this? Is what I'm asking. Can I have this kind of overlap? No, sir. No, sir. Yes, exactly. We cannot do that. See, already one co one. Uh, covalent bond is formed <clears throat> okay and if this is say this is my y-axis like I'm telling this direction is y-axis and say this is my z-axis assuming right so the, the or how to put it the the z orbital this is my pz and pz will be actually perpendicular to this plane isn't it this is my y-axis so my PZ will actually be perpendicular to this line, right? So then how will they undergo head-on collision like this? They will not be able to undergo head-on collision like this, but they can undergo some other type of collision, some other type of overlap, not head-on, but some other type of overlap, okay? So that overlap is what is called as lateral overlap. That, la that overlap is what is called as lateral overlap. So we'll speak about it now, okay? Right. Don't get like don't if you don't get down if you don't get it, please wait. You will eventually get it. Wait for it. Okay. So the another kind of overlap which I'm speaking about is like this. When I have a P orbital, right? And another P orbital. Okay, now this is not head-on collision. They're basically perpendicular, like this, and the lobes are little turning away. Lobes are little turning away. Now they are going to have a collision like this. Right, I'm going to have yes, a collision sir. like this, so I will be able to represent it like this. Yeah. So, what do you see here? so this is the shaded area. Right, this is the shaded area. Right, this is where the overlap is happening. This is not head-on collision. It's like the orbitals are like this, and there are two lobes. So one of the lobes are going to come like this and overlap. Are you able to get my point? Yes, sir. Right, so they are they are perpendicular, they are parallel like this. Now, initially, what happened in head-on overlap? They were coming like this, right? But when the, when the other type of overlap is there, the two orbitals are placed like this, and two of the lobes alone will come together, will form a bond. Basically, there are two more electrons here, isn't it? There are one electron here, one electron here. So again, in this shaded region, you will see one more electron. The electron pair getting shared, right? And then obviously there is one more bond getting formed. So there will be a O double bond O. One bond was formed by head on overlap, other one was, was formed by lateral overlap. Why is it happening like this? Because I took my y axis as the internuclear axis. So obviously, only PY can undergo head on collision. The other orbital, that is PZ, will not be able to undergo head on collision because the pegs are that P or P orbitals are going to place like this. It is impossible. Right, so obviously you know they have to undergo a lateral overlap to form the double bond like this. So there will be a double bond. I think Mithun asked some doubt. Second Mithun, what did he ask, sir? If PY and PY gets bonded with respect to Y axis, then PZ and PZ should get bonded with respect to Z axis, right? Okay. Ah, see, now that you already formed a bond, Mithun. Right? No, you already took 
this is the overlap this is the this is how the internuclear axis is right now the bond is already there this o bond o is already there right now this is y axis this particular plane is y axis correct now how will i have if at all this is my this is my y, z axis right this is my z axis how will you think it will overlap yeah, yeah. x axis only no sir that is how sir y axis oh kana everything is mutually perpendicular i can take anything as anything everything is 90 degree apart correct so i can even take this as the x axis x axis is not perpendicular no sir which is which is not perpendicular x axis how will it not be perpendicular now this is my y axis obviously so this is my y axis and say this is my z axis it it is perpendicular only right no one second i think there's a glare coming just give me a moment yeah tell me guys so did you understand what i'm telling right so yes. and yeah i think someone asked me a doubt did you understand kanna how is it yes, perpendicular sir okay cool so now you, you don't have to panic you don't have to worry right now always remember this okay so this is about o2 molecule you understood how the overlap and all is happening all that okay right so we are going to talk going to talk about types of overlap right overlap between the orbitals okay so the first type of overlap is what is called as head on overlap right the type of overlap is what is called as head on overlap the other one is what is called as lateral overlap so we saw both of them just now okay right so how what can be examples of head on overlap now please understand right please understand s orbitals s orbitals will i will tell i'm telling you that they will not be able to undergo lateral overlap they can only undergo head on overlap now it is understood right from the shape right now p orbitals are having lobes so they can join together but s orbital is spherical how can i undergo lateral overlap however you however you do it it is actually going to be head on overlap only because it is sphere i able to get what i'm saying right so s orbitals can never ever undergo lateral overlap right they can undergo only head on overlap okay fine so what now first i'll say say s s overlap right s s overlap we saw how is it going to look s s overlap right say second one is uh, s p overlap also i can have s orbital and p orbital are overlapping that is also possible say s Uh, this is another s s p overlap right i can even have p p overlap p p overlap also just now we saw this is one p this is another p overlap p d overlap sir sorry p d overlap ah p d overlap is not possible okay so remember that now head on overlap d orbitals can never ever undergo head on overlap because there are four lobes it is like it's it, it theoretically speaking it can form right it, theoretically speaking it can form so i can even have a, a thing like this so if you can imagine uh, say d orbitals are having double double shape say something like this and i can have another coming like this so again you can see head on overlap possible theoretically possible but in practical cases i don't see anything like this okay so there are only three kinds of head on overlap ss overlap sp overlap and pp overlap this is my pp overlap okay this is this are all possible in head on collisions sorry head on overlap okay fine now what about lateral overlap right now what, lateral overlap i i just now we saw how is it going to happen i can have a pp overlap or i can have a p d overlap only two things are possible right 
So first take down head on overlap, then I'll explain lateral overlap. So remember in lateral overlap, S orbitals cannot involve in lateral overlap. It can involve only in head on overlap because it's spherical in shape. There is no question of lateral overlap there. Okay, so we'll look into lateral overlap now. Hope you have taken this down the diagrams. Okay, now taking going to here, say I have PP lateral overlap. Just now we saw, say one of the lobes, another lobe, another lobe, another lobe. So you can see that there is a shaded region here. Right, there is a shaded region here. Again, a bond is formed. Now you see that here only one of the lobes are uh, lateral overlapping. I can even have two lobes overlapping. That is also possible. Say I'll be able to represent it like this. One, two, something like this. Are you able to get what I'm saying? Now you have two shaded regions. Right? So one over one lateral overlap, second lateral overlap. This is also PP. Both of them are PP. Okay. Say I go for uh, Next one is P and D overlap, right? Say P and D overlap can come like this. It's very simple. Say first I draw the D orbital. Uh, okay, say so one of the P orbitals now. So this is my D, this is my P. So you can see, again, there's a shaded region here. Okay, again, this is lateral overlap only, not head on overlap. This is lateral overlap. Okay, so yes, guys. So these are all the possible types of overlap I can have in chemistry, right? The first type of overlap is head on overlap, second type is uh, lateral overlap, and in that again, I have some subtypes. In last head on overlap, I have SS, PP, and SP, right? And in case of your lateral overlap, I have only two TP overlap and TD overlap. That's it. Right, so everybody understood the concept of overlapping. Please give me a yes. Yes, sir. Yes, right. Sir. Everybody understood. Okay, cool. Now, since there are different kinds of overlap, since there are different kinds of overlap, the bonds which are getting formed by these two different overlaps are going to be given two names. Okay, are going to be given two names, right. So the two names are whenever you have a head on overlap, right? Whenever you have a head on overlap, the bond, the covalent bond, which is getting formed is what is called as the Sigma bond. Very, 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 very important, right? So whenever you have head on overlap, I'm going to give some technical name to this bond, which is getting formed. And that bond is what is called as your Sigma bond, Sigma S I G M A. Sigma bond. Okay, so a sigma bond is formed whenever head on overlap happens. Okay, now whenever you have lateral overlap happening, whenever you have lateral overlap happening, that bond in chemistry are what are called as pi bonds. Right? What are called as pi bonds? Sigma bonds, pi bonds, very, very important. Sigma bonds, head on overlap, pi bonds, lateral overlap. Very simple. Okay, these names you have to remember. Okay, now what are all the other things which you have to know? Right now, please look into the statement which I'm going to tell you. Right, or we'll look, in, we'll look into it in a better way. Right now, the question is okay, sir, I understand that everything is overlapping, head on overlap is called sigma, lateral overlap is called pi. Which is stronger? Right, which is stronger? Sir. Which bond is stronger? Yes. Sir, no. Sir, yeah. for uh, head down overlap, you gave examples for uh, examples. Yeah. Sir. Sir, for okay. uh, this overlap, uh, what examples will you give? Sir, for lateral overlap. Lateral overlap, I gave no O2 molecule. In O2 molecule, there are two bonds. Right. First bond was formed by head down overlap. What happened to the second bond? Sir, okay, sir. No, understood, sir. Understood? Okay, very good, very good. Cool. Right. So, okay, so what I, what, what I was speaking is, which overlap is stronger or which bond is stronger is the question now right now the sigma bond is stronger or the pi bond is stronger is the next question right again 
even okay if one of them is stronger say as i i know that i'll tell you the, the reason sigma bonds are stronger okay i'll tell you why also but again even in the sigma bond right even in the sigma bond sigma bond can be formed by three types of head on overlap ss overlap sp overlap and tp overlap right among them which is stronger right all these questions can be asked isn't it the first question is which bond is stronger sigma bond is stronger or pi bond is stronger among sigma bond which like ss overlap sp overlap and tp overlap which is more stronger which is less stronger all these things i will be able to tell right so that we will see guys the names are very important sigma bonds and pi bonds and you will be using it in your entire life at least entire chemistry life okay cool so we are talking about the effective overlapping right which overlap is effective right and obviously more and more is the effective overlapping more and more the strong the more and more effective they come closer and be stronger right obviously the more and more will be the strength of the bond right more and more effective overlapping i have right more and more will be the strength of the bond okay now you think and tell me right which kind of overlap is going to be stronger head on overlap or lateral overlap effective overlapping basically effective in the sense i'm talking about the overlapping area say for example if i have s orbital i'm talking about this overlapping area more it's and done, more sir. is the area more and more will be the uh, effective overlap more and more will be the strength of the bond yes something you told rohan head on overlap ah, definitely stronger. right head on overlap is always stronger than lateral overlap effective overlap it right? means the head on overlap is always more effective than the lateral overlap so that you have to know so always and always please remember that sigma bonds are stronger than the pi bonds and the reason is head on overlap is always uh, effective effective than uh, lateral overlap okay it's understood right say if i have sns like this or even if i have pp like this say so pp like this they look at the amount of overlap rather than they coming like this on overlapping definitely i am not going to have much of much area of overlapping so if i if i come to consider pp sigma bond and pp pi bond pp sigma bond is more stronger than pp pi bond that is definitely understood head on overlap is always more effective than lateral overlap okay now coming to the next question next question is okay i understood the sigma bond is stronger right what about in sigma bonds i have different kinds of head on overlap to form sigma bonds that is ss sp and pp right now you think and tell me where i can have again it's all about effective overlap right in ss will i have more effective overlap or sp or pp you think and tell me ss yes, very good right because ss spherical isn't it s orbital is very highly spherical so obviously two spheres coming together and joining like this is way way more stronger than two p orbitals head undergoing collision like this again the, the area of overlap is going to be very very uh, less right so in sigma itself right ss overlap is stronger than sp overlap which is stronger than pp overlap right ss overlap is stronger than sp overlap and sp overlap is stronger than pp overlap wherever you have s obviously more and more effective overlap right so ss overlap is stronger than sp and sp is stronger than pp bond but sir that okay. means all of these bonds will be stronger than any, any pi bond exactly even all pp will be bond, stronger than pi bond yeah pp will be see in p sorry in pi bond what is the two only two criteria are there one is pp and pb correct so here i have a pp sigma bond in pi we have pp pi bond definitely pp sigma bond is strong okay sir okay right so this is about this thing and obviously when i go for pi or pi bonds when i go for pi bonds there can be two types of pi bonds possible p pi p pi and p pi d pi actually i can have d pi d pi also okay d pi d pi also is possible lateral overlap so obviously which do you think is going to be stronger out of these p pi p pi 
see pi p pi again come compared to d orbital p orbital is little okay the effective overlap is going to be little better so definitely p pi p pi overlap or p pi p pi bond is stronger than p pi d pi bond and the least of the strong the strong bonds are uh, the weakest of the bonds are basically going to be d pi d pi bonds okay right so the concept of sigma bonds and pi bonds everybody understood it's very important guys please give me a yes i want everybody to give an yes not only two three people yes right fine now i'll give you more insights right now i'll think about this okay now it's all about stability right it is all about now going to be stability okay now obviously the if the strength of the bond is higher right if the strength of the bond is higher i would say stability of the molecule is also higher is it not right if the strength of the bond is higher that means the stability of the molecule is also higher okay so <clears throat> if that's the case right now please understand this whenever a first bond is formed between two atoms whenever one bond is formed the first bond is formed between any two atoms for that matter that is always going to be a sigma bond always always the first bond which is getting formed is always going to be a sigma bond after the first bond right after the first bond how many ever bonds you form all of them are going to be pi bonds okay like remember this statement first bond between the two atoms is always a sigma bond because obviously it is stronger that is effect to overlap will happen that is what is favorable right so always the first bond always is going to be a sigma bond and after the first bond how many ever bonds you form are go are going to be pi bonds okay now how do i visualize this let me take some examples okay say if i take my o2 molecule right if i take my o2 molecule right there are two bonds here right is it not there are one bond two bonds. two bonds are there right i told you always the first bond which is getting formed will always be a sigma bond that means how can i how can i put it in a better way there will always be at least one sigma bond in every compound in every compound there will always be at least one sigma bond because the first bond which is getting formed itself is a sigma bond right after that whatever you form is going to be pi bond now in this question in this in this compound you tell me how many sigma bonds and how many pi bonds one sigma bond one pi bond wonderful right always the first bond which is getting formed is sigma after that how many ever is formed that is going to be pi right and please remember that i cannot have more than one sigma bond getting getting formed right you can even take it as a note more than one sigma bond between two atom is not possible there is only one which is possible and that will be the first bond which is getting formed after that how many ever bonds you form that is going to be pi bonds that i cannot have, i can have more than one pi bond also but i cannot have more than one sigma bond okay so i so have Doubt. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Yeah. So for head-on overlap for sigma bond, you told SP bond, no sir. S, S and P. S. So S could S you give an example of compound where that takes place? SP. Bond. Oh, you want to talk about SP head-on overlap? Yes, example. sir. SP. Ah, oh, wonderful. Example. HCl is the example, right? If I take HCl. Okay. Now we'll see what is happening here. Okay. So hydrogen is having one S one. Okay, so in s orbital i have one electron and you know in uh, chlorine i have 2 3p uh 5 as the valence electron configuration so 3p sorry 1 2 3 4 5 done say assume that this is pz so again you have to look at only for orbitals which are having unpaired electrons so these two orbitals are paired so this is there so you can see that there is only one bond between hydrogen and chlorine so you see that this s orbital from hydrogen and the pz of uh oxygen sorry chlorine will overlap to form a sigma bond okay so understood understood right 
they now pp overlap is or pp overlap is happening here in case of your oxygen sp overlap is this ss overlap example is hydrogen h2 1s1 1s1 yes sir right so yeah this is possible so what i was telling is that about the number of sigma and pi bonds right so here now only you told me i have one sigma and one pi correct okay now let me take this molecule nitrogen molecule now tell me how many sigma how many pi one sigma two pi guys everybody understood why is it one sigma and two pi Yes, sir. Abhishek, Abhishek, Mithun, Rohan, or I mean, Rohan, yes, the answer. Shruti, yes, everybody understood, right? So obviously, I have the first bond which is always formed is sigma. After that, how many ever bonds you form, that is going to be pi bonds. So I have one sigma. Now basically, I have one sigma and two pi bonds. Okay, right. Now I don't know whether you like. Let me take give you a complicated question. Okay, like let me see you can answer me. How many pi bonds and how many sigma bonds I have in that molecule? Have you ever heard benzene, guys? Have you heard the compound name benzene? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, what is the formula? C six H six, I think. Correct, correct. It is C six H six. Very good, right? So C six H six, right? Can I now with this itself? Can I tell how many sigma bonds and how many pi bonds are there? With the formula itself, can I say? Yes, sir. Okay, how many? Tell me. Six. Six what? Pi bonds, sigma bonds. Okay. So the thing is, guys. Just by looking at the formula, it is impossible for us to tell how many sigma and how many pi bonds we can have, right? We have to know the structure. We have to know the bond structure. Then only we'll be able to tell. Okay. But anyways, when I go for organic chemistry, you'll be able to predict like this. I will train you like that. But don't worry. But now I'm going to give you the structure, and then you will tell me how many sigma and how many pi. Okay. Fine. So this is how it is going to look. Ah, what am I? Am I drawing some rangoli? No, I'm not. I'll tell you. I'll explain you what is this. Okay, so this is the structure of benzene, right? So uh, don't get panicked again. It's very simple. The all the, you have, you see a hexagon here, right? You see a hexagon here. It has six vertices, right? Now in this six, all these vertex represents carbon atom. Basically, here I have a carbon atom, carbon atom, carbon atom, carbon atom, and carbon atom. All the vertex represents carbon atom. So I'll tell you how to represent this when I go for organic chemistry. Like when I go for some basic principles of organic chemistry. For now, just know that this is the structure. Okay. So I have a hexagon, right? And this is this is the structure. Like I have six hydrogens, six carbon atoms, like this. Now you calculate and tell me how many sigma and how many pi bonds. So between two two carbon atoms, the lines indicates the bonds. Okay, obviously the line between carbon and hydrogen also represents a bond. Sir, we take CH bond also separately, sir. Definitely, definitely. There is only one bond which is getting formed between C and H, so that that you know what is that going to be. So uh, there are two types of bonds here, guys. There are two types of bonds, not sigma and pi. I'm telling C C bond is there, C H bond is there. There are two types of bonds. 
So in CC itself, I can have sigma and pi. In CH itself, I can have sigma and pi. So totally, how many sigma, how many pi? Okay. Now, without calculating anything, can you tell me how many pi bonds are there in this molecule? Three, sir. Wonderful. Right. All of them are sigma bonds. Other than the first, other than the first bond, how much ever bond you form are pi bonds, right? So whenever you see, you know only so whenever you saw a double bond, one sigma and one pi. So you can see one, two, three. Like I'm not, I'm, I don't have a different color to mark it. Uh, I have a red color. I can mark it. So one, two, three. There are three pi bonds. Okay, that's it. All the other, all the others are sigma bonds because all the these things are first bonds, correct? So now I have say okay, between C C I C one, two, three, four, five, six. Now in C C itself I have six sigma bonds. Okay. Now in C H bond there is no question of whether it is going to have pi or something. It is definitely going to be only sigma because only one bond is there and that is definitely going to be sigma, right? So again if I calculate it one, two, three, four, five, six. Only how many sigma bonds? 12 sigma have, bonds. Right? So I have six CC sigma bonds and six CH sigma bonds. Totally 12 sigma bonds. Understood, guys? Everybody understood? Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Say, I'll give you one more example. I have uh, CH3 or no, I will go for. Okay, ozone molecule, O3, ozone, you would have heard it. The, you don't have the structure, I'll just give you the structure now. Okay, this is the structure. Okay, tell me, how many sigma, how many pi? Two sigma, uh, one pi. Uh, correct. So always, there are two, there are two kinds, okay, there are two oxygen bonds here. Obviously, if I mark the sigma bonds, the first bond which is getting formed between these two oxygen atoms is always going to be sigma. This is sigma. Again, the only one bond is there in this case. Again, that bond is definitely going to be sigma. Done. So obviously there are two sigma bonds, right? And obviously there is only one left. That is the second bond which is getting bond between these two oxygen atoms. So I have one pi bond. Sir, one doubt, sir. Yeah. Sir, in C six six also one bond is only getting formed, no sir. Then how, sir? We got three pi. Ah, okay. Now look at this. If I take. Uh, this two of this two carbon atoms okay if i take this two carbon atoms now there is already one bond getting formed correct right one one bond bond sigma, sir. so one bond is sigma sir ah first bond is sigma this bond is getting formed is sigma okay what about the next one you see the other bond is also getting formed right this between these carbon atom and this carbon atom yes sir ah that is my pi same way if i take these two carbon atoms sir, the first bond is get yes sir then how sir uh, 12 sigma ah correct there are there are 1 2 3 4 see first sigma bond second sigma bond third sigma bond fourth sigma bond fifth sigma bond sixth sigma bond this is only for cc all carbon atoms but i have one more type of bond also between carbon and hydrogen isn't it so first second third fourth fifth Six again. Six okay, okay, okay. CH sigma bond. Six CC sigma bonds. Totally twelve sigma bonds. Understood? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Right. So yeah, these are the concepts of sigma and pi bonds, people. Okay. So it's very easy. Like if you have any doubts, please ask it now. Go for it. You just say okay. You just shoot out any molecule, any molecule which you have come across. And tell we will try to see what is the structure, what is the Lewis dot structure, how many sigma bonds, how many pi bonds, how many lone pairs, all these things we'll see. You come in with a molecule, covalent molecule, not ionic molecule. Sir, no ion, sir, no ionic molecule. Ionic molecule, ah, okay. N3 there minus. Can be, yeah, N3 minus, or oh, we'll do it. Cool. Azide ion, it's called. Okay, say N3, 1 minus, this is 
is how it's going to look fine so there are going to be three nitrogen atoms right, there are going to be three nitrogen atoms okay fine <clears throat> now one of the nitrogen atom is having a negative charge there is no question which negative atom like obviously central atom preferably should not have right they will give the negative charge for any of these terminal nitrous atoms okay say so one of them is having a negative charge okay right so now i have to make sure like okay we know how many valence electrons are there in each nitrogen 2 comma 5 is the configuration so e, like these two nitrogen atoms will have five valence electrons and this nitrogen atom is going to have uh, six valence electrons okay because it is having a negative charge right so let me mark it so 1 2 3 4 5 6 1 2 3 4 5 again 1 2 3 4 5 5 these two for these two 5 and for this it is 6 okay so now uh, this night okay i'll do for okay now guys in n3 molecule there is going to be something strange happening right uh, how will i tell this other than, so when i go for covalent bonds there are three types of covalent bonds Two we already saw. One is sigma, another one is pi, and I have something called as coordinate bonds. And that's what is going to happen here, right? So I would tell it is not a good idea to study it now because next class we'll see what is coordinate bond. At the time I'll teach you, but instead of drawing the Lewis dot structure, I'll give you the direct structure. Okay, so it will be like this basically. N three minus. Will be like this. This is what you need to know. Double bond, double bond. Okay. Now okay, tell me sir. how many sigma and how many pi. Two sigma, two pi. Got it. So for between these two hydrogen, the first bond is sigma. Between these two hydrogen, the first bond is sigma. There are two sigma bonds. Okay. Now again, between these two hydrogen, there is a second bond which is getting formed. So one pi. Again, between these two hydrogen, there is a second bond getting formed. So there will be two pi bonds. Very simple. Okay, fine. Uh, I think I have some time. I will introduce you to the concept of what is this coordinate bond, right? Now, sigma and pi are going to vary in the overlap, like how the how the overlap of orbitals are happening. With respect to that, uh, my sigma and pi varies, but coordinate bond is an entire different case. Okay. Now, let me take a very small example. Like, actually, we'll come back to this example. I'll tell you how to draw the Lewis dot structure. Wait for it. But we'll take a little simpler example so that you'll be able to understand this better. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So coordinate bonds. Right now, coordinate bond are also called as dative bonds. D A T I V. Okay. Coordinate bonds are also called as dative bonds. Okay. now what special happens here like instead of telling explaining you let me go to take an example let me take the example of carbon monoxide co okay and we'll try to draw the lewis dot structure for uh, carbon monoxide <clears throat> okay fine so carbon is having four valence electrons right and oxygen is having six valence electrons 1 2 3 4 5 6 okay fine now oxygen atom requires two more electrons to satisfy its octet no problem so these two electrons are there da right so oxygen requires two more electrons to satisfy its octet it took right now i told you in covalent bonds is what is always going to be give and take how much ever you give that much you take so carbon is giving two electrons right carbon is giving two electrons so it will take two electrons that's what we expect isn't it carbon is giving two electrons and it should take two electrons say assuming that it is taking two electrons right assuming that it takes two electrons now see how many carbon i mean how many electrons are there in the valence shell for carbon already it had four electrons right but now it is taking two more electrons so the number of valence electrons on carbon is 6 4 plus 2 6 right it is not satisfying octet right See, I told you some molecules can have more than eight electrons if they are in the third period. 
not in the second period. I, there are reasons for this. We will again go for it later. But now understood that carbon for carbon octet is not satisfied. So this is not still unstable. Okay. So what is going to happen is you see that there are two more lone pairs present on this molecule on this oxygen atom. So these two electrons are going to get shared or are going to are going to get shared between carbon and oxygen, right? Even though in this, this is a very special case. Generally, what happens in a covalent bond? Whatever one element gives. That much electron that element takes, right? So it gives two electrons. It took two electrons. But what happened here? You see that the octet is not satisfied. Still, for carbon, for oxygen, it's okay, no problem, right? So now what is going to happen? Say so for your uh, octet to get satisfied for carbon, the two electrons that are extra here are actually going to go to car of carbon atom, giving it uh, giving it an octet, right? So let me represent it like this, okay? So I, okay, I had. Okay, so I had a carbon atom, right? Now there are two bonds which are normally formed, like first bond, second bond, and obviously out of that, one of them is sigma, one of them is pi. That is understood. Okay, but there is a third bond which is getting formed here. The third bond which is getting formed here, which means like uh, I'll be able to put it like this. Like this arrow mark represents. A coordinate bond. So this arrow mark represents a coordinate bond. This arrow mark represents a coordinate bond, isn't it? Like this arrow mark represents that the lone pair, that is the two electrons, are coming from oxygen to carbon, right? This is coming from oxygen to carbon. That's what the arrow mark indicates. Okay. So what is so special about coordinate bond in a normal covalent bond? Two electrons are shared, and one electron coming from one atom, the other electron coming from other atom. That's a normal covalent bond. But if it is a coordinate bond, yes, there are a one, two electrons for a coordinate bond to be formed. But the only difference is both the electrons, both the electrons are coming from single atom. That is, in this case, it is oxygen atom. Right, there are two electrons here. Both the electrons are coming from a single atom, but these two bonds are different. One electron coming from carbon, another electron coming from oxygen. One electron coming from carbon, another electron coming from oxygen. These are normal covalent bonds, pi bonds and sigma bonds. Right, but if you look at this bond, right, both the electrons are coming from oxygen, and that is getting donated to carbon. Basically, this is also shared, right? But both the electrons are coming from one single atom. Those kinds of bonds are what are called as coordinate or dative bonds. Okay, so we'll see more examples next class. So guys, did you understand what is happening here? At least the gist of it, everybody understood? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, cool. So hope you understood what is coordinate bond. We'll see more about this in the next class. I'll give you more examples. We'll explain that N3 minus which you asked me. There are some more examples where I can have coordinate bonds. All those we'll see. Okay, fine, guys. Until then. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir.